Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Rasula Kundu. I'm at the Center for Urban Policy and Governance at the uh, School of Habitat Studies at TIS. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Salim Khan. Um, though we haven't met in person because of the pandemic, but he's been with us for almost more than a year now. Um, and it's strange to be actually connecting over an online format, but nonetheless, uh, we're really excited to have him on board uh, to give us this uh, talk about uh, his ongoing research, uh, which is uh, which is kind of very appropriate, timely, relevant at this moment where uh, just yesterday we have celebrated the World Cities Day. And I think, uh, you know, with the COP26 in progress, uh, one of the key things that uh, cities need to be looking at is the question of uh, climate change and therefore uh, building resilience. Um, and so today, his talk where he's talking about uh, the rising seas and thinking cities, um, it's uh, important to sort of bring together us as a school because uh, we have four programs. And here I can see we have our colleagues, our um, MPhil PhD students, as well as others who have joined us here uh, to sort of hear uh, Salim speak. A little bit about Salim. Salim is an assistant professor at the Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Studies at the School of Habitat Studies. Uh, his broad areas of research expertise are climate change adaptation, climate services, and uh, sustainable development. So he sort of brings together and marries together both concerns for the urban as well as climate change. Uh, he obtained his PhD in climate change adaptation from the Center for Climate Change and Adaptation Research at Anna University in Chennai. Uh, currently, he's also based out of Chennai. He's, uh, he also has a dual postdoctoral uh, degree. Uh, he, has, ha he did a Fulbright, uh, he was a Fulbright Fellow at the Earth Institute in Columbia University of New York and also at the same time an Institute Postdoctoral Fellow of the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Madras in Chennai. Um, and before he joined us at TIS, he has worked uh, in various uh, state government uh, projects on climate change, et cetera. And he brings this knowledge, he brings this expertise therefore uh, today to his talk. Uh, and this is uh, what I believe is part of his ongoing research uh, about uh, the rising seas. So welcome, uh, once again, welcome everyone. And um, I now sort of uh, give over the floor to Salim. Uh, so we will do like a 40 minute presentation, which will then be followed by uh, question and answers uh, from the audience, okay? Thank you, Salim. Thank you, Ratula. Uh, thanks for that nice introduction. Millions and millions of people dwelling right on the coast. Thousands and hundreds of hectares of the land on the low-lying coastal region. Heavy investment in, in infrastructures, uh, right from building the port to the thermal power plant, high-rise building, recreational corridor, and many other. Abundant biodiversity from mangroves, corals, aquaculture, fisheries, and many other. All these resources are under the threat of just one meter rising sea level. Yes, it is just one meter rising sea level. And cities in particular across the world are at the hotspots that are vulnerable to these impact of rising sea level. With this note, I welcome you all uh, to my presentation, Rising Seas and Sinking Cities, Finding Ways for Adaptation. And I'm Salim Khan uh, from the Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainability Studies. I take this opportunity to thank uh, our school uh, as well as the Dean of the school, in particular, Ratula, as well as my colleague from the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability Studies. 
So I have just uh, planned my presentation this way so that it is easy for you guys to take home some messages. Part A, I'll just give an outline of what is sea level rise. And part B, uh, I take you to a case study which I have experienced in, in New York City. Uh, and we developed a tool called Corridor. Uh, and then a part C, uh, I will talk about another case study from the global south, which is from Chennai City. And we have evolved another framework called BASIC. And finally, some take home messages for you. This particular picture is very popular in climate science, uh, in particular climate communication. This picture talks about uh, the temperature increase in the last century and each line, which is nothing but a stripe, that represents the temperature of that particular year. So if you see this graph or this picture from uh, left to right, the color changes from blue to red, so which is uh, nothing but uh, increase in temperature. Scientists strongly believe that, at least in this 21st century, uh, there is a need to communicate the complex climate science, in this case, the sea level rise into simple form. And researcher like me, uh, we are interested in communicating these complex science into simple form. And I hope today I do justice uh, for the given opportunity, starting from this picture. So this picture represents there is an increase in temperature in the last 100 years. And just because of that increase in temperature, we all aware that the Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement comes with a statement of not going beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, there is a high confidence, according to IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that there is an increasing level of sea level in the past century, from 1,880 to 2,000, uh, close to 20. This particular graph talks about the rising sea level. This is a global sea level <clears throat> increase. Uh, we have observed the data both from satellite as well as the tide gauge data. So tidal gauge or kind of a, a rain gauge that is located in the port. So that measures the uh, height of a seawater uh, from the mean sea level. So usually we have high tide and low tide and average of that is called a mean sea level. So anything that rises beyond that mean sea level, it is considered as a rising sea level. So this particular uh, figure indicates that there is an uh, increase in uh, nine inches of sea level. So nine inches roughly come to 0.3 meter. Now, there are three major reasons for this sea level. And if you see this picture again, you find a progressive increase in the numbers that uh, the graph is going up. And particularly, there is an accelerated increase in 1980s to 2000. So this is where the pre-industrial uh, or industrialization has taken place. And that leads to high temperature, which in turn results in melting of glaciers. Now, these three reasons, one is melting of glaciers. Another is thermal water expansion on the sea, which means increase in the density of water. And third is the changes in the water that's stored in the uh, coastal area, we say aquifers. In addition, there are many other phenomena uh, like uh, saltwater intrusion, uh, low-lying topography. All these favors uh, that the coastal areas are vulnerable to rising sea level. The global prediction says, again, the IPCC in its AR5, the assessment report five says that maybe an increase in rising sea level from 0.26 meter to 0.82 meter, which is less than a meter. You may surprise, is one meter is a big issue? If you take a ruler, the scale that you used to draw lines, if you measure that, you'll be uh, surprised. Just 30 centimeter, that's going to make a difference. To be honest, yes. That's the prediction and that's the observation that we have had so far. There are many areas inundated 
to rising sea level so far. And we are expecting many more areas are under threat if this condition continues. Now, one such measure to uh, respond to the rising sea level is adaptation. In climate change, there are two contexts. One is mitigation and other is adaptation as a response strategies. Now, mitigation is to stop. For an example, you can stop emitting the carbon or the greenhouse gases by going uh, green fuel or green uh, energy efficient uh, automobiles or whatever you name it. But certain things you cannot stop. You cannot go to Juhu Beach or Marina Beach and say, hey, see, don't rise up. That you cannot do it. Certain things you cannot stop, but only you can adapt. And that is called adaptation. Now, this sea level will have a considerable amount of impact on human population, infrastructure, coastal and marine systems, which I stated in my beginning of the presentation. In particular, the cities are the hotspots. Now, why cities are hotspots? Cities are the place with too much of population, the urban density, too much of development, heavy investment in infrastructure. So that always uh, be an eye catch. Uh, also that determines the vulnerability. So if there is a sea level and it impact on a barren coastal land, and you have another scenario where the sea level impact on highly populated urban region, then obviously the priority goes to cities. In that line, if you take the global cities, many of the global cities are on the seafront. And these cities uh, are mostly located in the low-lying topography. However, each city differ from place to place, their location, topography, and the mean sea level. That's what they say, though the global mean sea level is high, its impact vary from place to place. So impact in New York may be different from uh, impact in Mumbai of the same sea level rise. Now, if you see this graph or picture, this says that 10 to 50 million people are located in the global south, the dark maroon color picture that uh, you can see in India and other part of the South Asian region. And then on to 9 million people uh, in, in the red color that you can see in most of the Americas and also in some part in South America and few other places in Africa. Now, if you go for the investigate, you can see this uh, map from the American Geophysical Union. Uh, this is from the Earth's Future, one of the journals that says that these are the key cities or top priority cities that are at risk to rising sea level. On the left, you can see uh, New York, Boston, Virginia, New Orleans. and the middle, you can see Amsterdam, uh, Rotterdam, uh, Alexandria, and, and uh, Lagos. On the right, you see so many. Uh, that includes uh, Chennai, Mumbai, Kolkata uh, in India, as well as uh, Tokyo, Shenzhen uh, in uh, China, Hong Kong. So these are the cities that are at risk to rising sea level. So this particular picture uh, in the, comes with a color combination on dark red to yellow to green. So that represents the different uh, meter or the measurement of rising sea level. Nevertheless, the impact is going to be severe in all of these cities. Only thing is the uh, magnitude of impact may differ from place to place. However, these cities are considered as highly vulnerable to rising sea level. Uh, this picture is just a snapshot. Uh, what has happened in big cities like New York when Hurricane Sandy was there, and Venice, Italy, which is just a couple of years before, Amsterdam, Netherlands, Alexandria, Egypt, Guaygo in Ecuador, Lagos in Nigeria, Shanghai, China, Tokyo, Japan, Jakarta, Indonesia, Mumbai, India, Kolkata, and Chennai in India. And Chennai on the right, you can see uh, that is uh, during Varda cyclone, which is roughly around 2016, 17. Uh, and that is completely flooded due to a high rise in seawater. 
Now, IPCC has defined the definition of sea level rise from AR1 to AR5 by stating that uh, earlier in AR1, sea level rise means the increase in seawater from the mean sea level. But if you go and verify AR5 report and the definition for sea level, it also included the frequent storm surges and its height. So scientists predict that the frequency and the intensity of the storm surges also due to changing climate. So they combine sea level rise, which is a permanent slow ongoing rise from the mean sea level together with the frequent storm surges height because that helps to plan the adaptation strategies by the city government or uh, any coastal uh, governance where one could respond to the rising sea level. As they said above, uh, the process of adjustment is called as an adaptation. Uh, in simple, uh, ability to adjust. For example, when you go out of home, you feel it is hot then you wear a cotton shirt and then you go out. Or when you go out of the home, it is raining heavy. You come and take your umbrella and then go. So you adapt to the situation. Here, the umbrella and the cotton shirt is the uh, measures of uh, strategies of adaptation. This is just a small example for you to uh, explain uh, or, or you know, put it in a simple one line. It is nothing but ability to adjust. Uh, we as a human always look for comfort. It's a difficult job for us, but it is an easy as well if you have an ability to adjust to the change. Now, in coastal adaptation, there are three uh, major strategies or emphasized. One is called retreat, another is called protect, and third one is accommodate. Retreat is there is a sea level. You go away from the sea level means you go away from the coastal area. The first picture says you see a two houses. One house is here. So that has been replaced to a different location. So you migrate from vulnerable region to another region. That is called retreat. Protect, you still remain in that same place, but you have different other measures. For example, sea wall. In the second picture, you can see a black uh, divider kind of thing. That is a stop, stop block that prevents you from the sea wall, sea water. So for example, sea wall is one such in a measure for protect. Whereas accommodate, you live in the same place in such a way so that you change your ability in a different level. So you enhance your resilience, you enhance your capacity. In this case, you can see the building is raised a few meter up. So these are the three different strategies of coastal adaptation. So whatever adaptive measures we take it, it broadly falls under these three. And there are a number of adaptive uh, approaches out there. Some are called ecosystem-based approach, some are called community-based approach, and some are called uh, engineering or infrastructure-based approach. For example, seawall is an infrastructure-based uh, adaptation. Whereas ecosystem uh, is, um, for example, uh, Bioshield. You have a, if you travel around the coastal region, maybe if you have some kind of a road, if you travel around, you may be able to find out a coastal uh, biodiversity there. Uh, for example, a plantation of casuarina. So that acts as a protective barrier uh, between you and the sea. So I was taught once, uh, and uh, they asked me a question uh, why there are eyebrows for men? Of course. The answer is like we protect the eyes or the nature has created in such a way that the eyes are protected uh, by the eyebrows from the salt water that comes as a sweat from the head. Likewise, here the eyebrows are coastal biodiversity, coastal bioshield, mangroves or casuarina. Whereas eyes are you, me, I, the building, the infrastructure, uh, whatever we have, that is the resources. Whereas the sweat that comes from the head is nothing but the sea level. So when the sea level comes up and your mangrove or your bio shield that act as a uh, eyebrow filters the water and drains by side so that your eyes are protected. And that is the analogy that we have been taught to understand the importance of coastal biodiversity uh, and its role in ecosystem-based adaptation. 
Likewise, community-based adaptation, uh, where the people play a major role uh, in adaptation, particularly the fishing communities. Uh, and there are different other stakeholders involved uh, in community-based adaptation. It's not only the ecosystem on the uh, engineering measures, but also people should be able to cope up uh, with the changes, with the impact of sea level. And that is called community-based adaptation. When IPCC is talking about all these scientific findings, uh, parallelly, United Nations and Article 6 and Article 11 demands the scientists to communicate this complex climate information and engage the stakeholder in decision making and make people to understand uh, the science of climate in a simple language by providing information and data and engage the people. Based on the guidelines of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that is something called GFCS, which is Global Framework for Climate Services. Now, climate service is a new domain in climate change research. Uh, that takes a lot of attention because it is the need of the hour, which is nothing but a provision of climate information to assist decision making. You provide climate information to different stakeholders, into policy planner, to a community, uh, to even to a a research group, academia, or a diplomat. So whoever you feel uh, as a potential stakeholder, you can communicate that information and provide that information and involve them in decision making. This GFCFs gives five guidelines and one of the guidelines is capacity development. And that is the place I come into the picture by having this background of understanding climate science uh, and its importance of sea level rise impact uh, and finding ways for adaptation. Uh, meanwhile, climate services plays a major role in building capacities uh, to rise in sea level. So with this backdrop of little bit of science, I will uh, take you to um, one of my case studies that I work as a Fulbright scholar in the Earth Institute Columbia University with New York City as a case study. When I went to New York and having this idea of sea level rise, I was surprised there are so many uh, work uh, that has been done already in the New York City. These are the, some of the major documents by the city government of New York. Uh, for example, climate risk information, a stronger, more resilient New York, and many other documents. Now, what was missing? When we had a stakeholder meeting uh, to different set of audiences in New York City, they said like, there are too many information on sea level. So people not able to understand what exactly sea level. So these documents are subjective to scientists and even it is very difficult for the policy planner to understand. Then imagine the role of a, a citizen, a common public to understand the science of sea level. So what we realized, though there are too many information, but still there are no clarity on uh, to understand the subject of sea level, what to communicate, uh, why we need to communicate the sea level information to New Yorkers, and where to communicate, is it throughout New York City required this kind of a capacity building or one specific location, which is vulnerable? If yes, when to communicate and whom to communicate? New York is a tourist spot. There are so many people keep coming and keep going out. So who are your stakeholder here? and how to communicate. And that is the biggest challenge uh, because communicating science to a scientist is different. Whereas communicating science to a non-scientist is a challenging task. So our um, first step to try to find answer for these questions, and we came up with an idea called CORRIDOR. CORRIDOR is an acronym, which means uh, communicating risk of sea level rise and engaging stakeholders in framing community-based adaptation. So this key uh, acronym is taken from jumble of letters from this definition as corridor. Uh, as if you're looking for a technical information from my presentation, and this is your first take home message. Corridor gives eight steps. So if somebody wants to know about sea level rise as a beginner, or if someone really want to work on hardcore science as a scientist, or if someone in the policy planning side to understand the scientific information and translate that into policy.
for all sort of people, we come up with eight different steps we collectively call as the corridor. So each step, there is a science behind. But the objective of this uh, eight step is just to inform if somebody wants to know, they should know where to start and where to end. And we tried this for with uh, college students and it was very successful. They were very happy because they study sea level rise with so many graph, everything. But end of the day, the whole uh, the holistic observation of sea level somewhere missing. And this particular uh, framework greatly helped them to uh, know which road they need to take if they want to address sea level and where to end. For example, the first step is to understand the climate of your particular region, and which includes sea level. Let us take New York City as a case study. If somebody wants to address, we first need to know what New York is all about through the lens of climate. What is the elevation of New York City? To a surprise, uh, the elevation of New York City is zero, which is just on to the main sea level. Even one millimeter rising sea level can inundate New York City. And that has happened when Sandy has struck the coast of New York. So we need to know the topography of a particular region. Even if you want to take it somewhere in Kolkata, then the first step you want to know is what is Kolkata's climate and what is uh, sea level rise means to Kolkata? In this case, what is the elevation? Then the second step is the past sea level trend. The, uh, we can get the past sea level trend from tidal data information from PSMSL, which is called Permanent Service for Mean Sea Level. So you can get the data, the tidal data uh, from uh, the port of that particular region. Those data are stored in PSMSL. So you can get an idea by plotting a graph for the last 100 years, what has happened, whether the sea level has increased or not. And third one is projection of future sea level. And this is where the place where climate modelers come into the picture. We use different sophisticated, um, computationally high climate models to give future projections of sea level. There are different climate models. They use different techniques like down scaling techniques or a pattern scaling technique. Uh, and with the help of those techniques, uh, under different scenarios of IPCC, uh, in this case, RCP, representative concentration pathways, uh, we can give a future projection of sea level of that particular area. And step four is the predicting the sea level rise impact. If, let us assume, the step two says there is point, uh, three, five millimeter as increased sea level in a particular location. Whereas step four says by future, you may expect 0.5 meter rise in sea level by end of the century. Now the question is, if that is a 0.5 meter sea level rise, what will happen to that particular place? In this case, what will happen to New York? Uh, which is uh, give a map, the area of inundation. A certain area of New York may get submerged. Now, what are the places uh, of those area? Uh, and that's where the fifth step comes into the picture, identifying the vulnerable communities and infrastructure. That particular area may be a region of Times Square. We do not know. That particular area may be a Columbia University. We do not know. That map will convey as a message within New York City, which is highly vulnerable. And step six help us to communicate so that is the place this kind of a framework tool uh, greatly help us uh, how the scientific the step one to five can be communicated. If it is in Times Square, then who are the stakeholders? Uh, is it the uh, shopkeepers, is the building owners, or is there any other um, big corporate companies that located? Then they are our stakeholders. So the information should be communicated to them than to a tourist who visit quite often to that place because they are not going to make a big impact on taking a decision. Rather, the building owner, the property owners play a big role. So step six talks about that. And step seven, uh, you come up with a different kind of a strategy. I will show you there are a few uh, adaptive strategies that the city government of uh, New York has taken. And uh, we need to come up, as I said, infrastructure-based adaptation, community-based adaptation, ecosystem-based adaptation. So these are three different broad uh, way of strategies that we can identify what we need to do. And the very important thing uh, as a planner, as a policy guy, 
uh, what we face is all these strategies are fragmented. Uh, now, we are finding ways to integrate with developmental activities of the city. And that is where the, the realistic picture of implementing the adaptation strategy come into view. Uh, uh, till step seven is more of exercise and theory based, where step eight is actual platform that gives an avenue to implement whatever the strategy uh, we come up from the step seven, so that uh, with the developmental activities of the city development, which could be anything, uh, transport development or uh, portal authority development. So you incorporate, in other words, we use the word called mainstream. You mainstream the new climate or sea level adaptive strategies with the existing developmental strategies. And that will greatly help uh, in urban planning, particularly uh, in the phase of uh, challenging uh, threats of climate change and sea level rise. As this corridor framework uh, comes up with like this kind of a tool with number of checklists. So if somebody wants to exercise this, uh, you can uh, download and you can start filling these information. But the caution here is each step, maybe step one and two are easy to fill it, whereas step three and four is nothing but a scientific information. As I said, climate models, do you have a climate model information? Luckily, in New York City, uh, we have information for all the seven steps except the last one. So it was easy for uh, researchers like me to test this tool in particular. And we tested this tool with one place called Jamaica Bay in New York City. On the left, you see the map of New York with five different boroughs. One is Manhattan, another is Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Whereas um, Jamaica Bay is located in the adjacent of Brooklyn and Queens. On the right, you see Jamaica Bay. Now, what is Jamaica Bay? Jamaica Bay is, is a marshland in the city limit. And that is the greatest blessing of New York City that you have a, a green uh, arrangement or a green wealth in the busiest, biggest city in the world. And the, this picture clearly indicates that uh, you see uh, Times Square at the backdrop of the first picture. So Jamaica Bay is very next to JFK, John F. Kennedy Airport. And uh, the city is starting from there. Now, the important measure here is if we protect Jamaica Bay marshland, it can act as a buffer. I said an analogy, why eyebrows are there. So if we protect Jamaica Bay, we can protect Brooklyn and Queens. If that is a sea level on storm surges, this picture can clearly uh, tells you that on the right, if there is a storm surge and sea level on the Atlantic Ocean, provided if we have or protected Jamaica Bay so that the major areas of Brooklyn and Queens of New York City can be protected. So our aim is to investigate how this particular tool can be used. So we have mapped using GIS uh, with how much of area of inundation may take place um, in, in New York City. So these pictures uh, are uh, more of GIS based, but the information is here. There are different uh, regions within the Jamaica Bay where people are living there. It is kind of a small block or a county or even a village is there. For example, uh, Cooney Island or uh, Seagate, uh, which is at the Cooney Island, as well as the Brighton Beach. So this table will give uh, out of our corridor, step one, two, three, four, uh, this gives an idea uh, how much area may inundate it and which are those area that are vulnerable to rising sea level. And we have taken up uh, all these places for our uh, investigation. And we have found out a couple of places like a Rockaway, Rockaway Center, uh, that is the area within this Jamaica Bay. And we have done an investigation uh, with the communities and other stakeholders. Now, broadly speaking, New York is a city of hope. New York comes with magnificent ideas. On the right side, you see on the top, like a Great Wall of China, New York is coming up with an idea called Great Wall of Manhattan. So you construct a Great Wall, which is nothing but a seawall, entire Manhattan region, as well as the Brooklyn, 
uh, wherever possible other than the Jamaica Bay. Now, this is on proposal, uh, but there are shortcomings, there are challenges with the Great Wall. But the point here is New York has its own idea. On the down, you see a soft structure. You create a buffer in the form of creating a green infrastructure around the uh, hard infrastructure here, the hard infrastructure of the high rise building. So it is called sponging effect, uh, these green uh, uh, kind of a park. So these are meticulously planned, both in the context of development of a city, together with the impact of climate change, in this case, sea level rise. So our recommendation, uh, we have given up recommendation that building seawalls or shoreline armoring in certain regions of Jamaica Bay is essential. Green infrastructure, uh, they are also called as living shorelines, uh, which is there in Jamaica Bay. Now we need to strengthen it. Uh, we need to maintain the sediment of that area so that the sedimentation process can uh, favor the marsh to survive for a long. Those are ecosystem-based and community-based also. We tried uh, community resilience through educational program. We uh, done a couple of uh, workshops with Brooklyn College City University of New York uh, to sensitize people with the sea level rise information and how they can uh, understand the logic behind uh, adaptation and why they need to adapt. And, and also the Earth Institute Columbia University, uh, we got an opportunity to uh, introduce corridor tool in City University of New York and Earth Institute to the city government uh, so that they can adopt uh, these kind of a tools and framework in their plans. Uh, and of course, we published that in uh, Springer in Climate Change Adaptation in North America. And also you can find uh, this particular paper, Building Resilience of Urban Ecosystem and Communities to Sea Level Rise in Jamaica Bay and New York City. Now, what was so satisfying for us is this was noted by the United Nations Academic Impact, and it has appreciated by telling a corridor, a new tool help communities better understand climate change. And another state of the planet by the Earth Institute applauded this particular work as corridor helping communities respond to climate change. Now, these are the people behind, and uh, since you many of you come from the urban background, the third from the uh, first draw, Cynthia. You must be knowing Cynthia Rosenzweig, one of the very popular figure uh, in uh, urban climate change adaptation. She's an agricultural specialist, but still she's known uh, for her expertise in urban adaptation. So we all joined together, uh, worked uh, for this particular framework or a tool called Corridor. Of course, this is funded by uh, Fulbright and Government of India, uh, CUNY and uh, Earth Institute. So the one take home message of part B is corridor, which is the eight step approach. If somebody interested in corridor or interested in sea level rise, this eight step guidelines will help you to kickstart your understanding, kickstart your work. And that is uh, my contribution or my gift to you. And second one is Chennai city. Now, when we done with the work of corridor, there was one question raised. Uh, by the uh, during the North American symposium. Well, corridor suits very well for a developed nations uh, and its city like New York or London. What happened to uh, the developing nations? Whether this particular framework or tool will suit to uh, developing country like Chennai or Philippines, Manila, elsewhere. But that question made us to think a lot because one side of the globe, like the developed nation, too many data, too many information. So corridor logic helps very well there. Whereas other part of the world, no much data or data is not able to access easily. There are a lot of shortcomings in data part. So we were little uh, hesitant in working on a corridor with global, I mean, uh, Southern part of the world, particularly the um, Asian countries. But still, we made an attempt. Like New York, the documents, uh, we have taken Chennai City as a case study. Um, uh, one of the uh, findings from IPCC list of vulnerable cities in India, Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, and Surat. So I have taken Chennai because I come from there. I want to work on it. 
So on the right side, you see resilient Chennai strategy. Um, this is the work done by the Corporation of Chennai with Rockefeller Foundation and C40 cities. Uh, they give a lot of information, a lot of uh, guidelines how to build the resilience of Chennai city. However, uh, this document, uh, we want to emphasize on climate part and sea level rise part. So we have taken uh, one particular, like Jamaica Bay in Chennai, we have an area called Ennur. Uh, Ennur, this is the picture of Ennur. Now, why Ennur? Ennur is in the northern Chennai. Uh, it is highly populated and a lot of industries are there. We have Ennur thermal power plant is there. The energy supply of southern states in India are greatly contributed by the Ennur thermal power plant. And we have a Chennai port, the Kamaraj port is there. Importantly, there is a river, it's called Kusastalaya River, where the huge fishing community dependent on the river for their livelihood. There's one particular uh, way of fishing called Padu system. Padu is an indigenous or traditional way of capturing fish by the uh, artisanal fishers. Artisanal fishers are the small scale fishers. Now, the livelihood of these people are highly affected by these industries. So that is one side. On top of it, sea level rise makes the region more vulnerable because the area is at the very much low-lying region and it has the heavy soil erosion, which is a coastal erosion. So that makes this area more vulnerable to rising sea level. As I said, in New York City, we had data, whereas for Chennai City, to be very honest, we do not have much. We just followed the guidelines in corridor. We uh, taken, again, the data from PSMSL for the past sea level trend, and we come to know that uh, 0.35 millimeter per year has increased in sea level. This graph shows, um, if not a very inclining trend, but still it is on the positive line. We have used uh, one of the climate modeling software called Simclim. Simclim is a model developed by the uh, New Zealand group of researchers by the Klimsit system that uses a pattern scaling technique. So this is where the climate modeling comes to the picture. There are people who work on downscaling technique. Here, the pattern scaling technique is one of the methods uh, that has been adopted to give future sea level projection. Now, what we have found, uh, Chennai city may expect a sea level rise uh, of roughly between 0 0.25 meter to 0 0.85 meter. So close to one meter sea level rise. That is our key findings. And this has been again published. Uh, under the RCP scenario. So I just highlighted RCP 2.6 and 8.5 uh, IPCC scenarios. So that gives um, accurate information at the local level. So one of the strength of our, uh, this particular component of research is we do not have local level sea level projection. That is the uh, you know, catch point and that we got attention from the government because we always quote IPCC. That is a global projection. But this is the first time in, in India, uh, along with NIO Goa, they have projected sea level based on storm surges. And we are the first people to give uh, sea level projection for a particular location, in this case, Chennai City, uh, under the RCP scenarios of uh, AR5, based on assessment report five. And this graph talks about if there is a point five to one meter sea level in Chennai city, what will happen? So the two areas are vulnerable. One is South Chennai uh, and another is North Chennai. So we have taken North Chennai as our steady area, which is nothing but anymore. And parallelly, we were very keen uh, in introducing the community knowledge or indigenous knowledge in our research. And this thought uh, has come when we had a discussion with the state government that we want to contribute to the state action plan. So according to the state action plan guideline, it is not only the scientific information that comes into the picture, but also the uh, community's knowledge is also play a major role. So we came up with this idea called BASIC. Again, BASIC is an acronym, which means building capacity for adaptation to sea level rise through information, education, and communication. So we have identified three different pillars. So with the help of Corridor, uh, we collected 
we generated data for Chennai city. After that, we evolved this framework based on the guidelines of GFCS and the requirement of state action plan that three different pillars are essential to communicate this information and involve the local community in decision making, which is nothing but information, communication and education. To execute this process of exercise of basic, we have adopted a number of participatory approaches. On the left side, you see a focus group interview, transact work, risk mapping, uh, many things. One such an example here is stakeholder analysis. Uh, you identify who are the key stakeholders of the area. And here are the few pictures uh, that we have done. And the important uh, finding of this is we involve citizens, the local community, the through citizen science program as part of climate service in the adaptation decision making. Now, we have recommended a number of adaptation strategies uh, under the component of community-based adaptation. Uh, these are the broad strategies we have given. For example, diversified livelihood, um, migration to an elevated area, insurances, uh, weather-based insurances, uh, particularly for the uh, coastal communities are not at all addressed. They have an informal insurance, uh, informal uh, financial management among the local community are there but there is no formal uh, or a legitimate uh, insurance mechanism out there. So we recommended that. And of course, capacity building is our uh, prime component. Uh, for, to execute this process, we adapted a pairwise ranking method. Now, of course, uh, these are all published, uh, one on Journal of Coastal Conservation, another on Handbook of Climate Services. And importantly, uh, we are expecting this publication very soon uh, based on the International Conference on Climate Services. So we have taken this case study and introduced this BASIC tool. Now, what is our strength of BASIC? Like Corridor, uh, we have done for New York City. So New York government has adopted uh, so many tools and framework and Corridor is one of the tools and it has been acknowledged by the United Nations. Now for the case of sea level uh, and our study BASIC in Chennai, we contributed to Tamil Nadu State Action Plan on Climate Change. And if you see chapter four and section 4.4, uh, and in pages 74 and 75 and 76, whatever I have said so far with Chennai, you can see uh, those information set. And we find that is our strength, that is our success, that BASIC has gone beyond the academic limits and reached to a policy level. Uh, here is the policy document. So here are a few people who worked along with me for BASIC. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran, who was my supervisor, and a few other people. And these are the uh, funders and supporters of uh, this work uh, by the government of India. An important thing is uh, Department of Science and Technology through SPLICE Climate Change Program. It is one of the uh, funding mechanism. Uh, through that funding mechanism, so this one component of BASIC has been accomplished. And that is what communicated to climate services. So final take home message, I don't want to bother you much of you guys with your, with your time. Um, you can take three things to home. One, sea level rise and its impact on uh, cities. Cities are always a place of hope, a place of opportunities, and it can showcase so many things to the rest of the world. And that is what city on the one hand, they are vulnerable, no matter, not only sea level rise, any kind of impact. On the other side, cities are place of hope and promises. You can exhibit, you can experiment any kind of activity successfully and showcase to the rest of the world. So sea level rise and coastal cities, that understanding could be one of the take home messages. And two, corridor, which are eight step approach. If someone wants to know about sea level rise technically uh, or do something on sea level rise, just follow this eight step maybe this will help you to uh, start your journey. And third basic is three pillar. So once you're done with your eight step, then if you want to move towards, uh, engage the community in decision making, these three pillar, which is education, the communication and information education and communication, these three pillar can greatly help you. I would like to conclude by saying uh, from uh, Charles Darwin, he said in his book, Origin of Species, 
it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. In other words, in the struggle for survival, the fittest win out at the expense of the rivals because they succeed in quote unquote, adapting themselves best to the environment. In, in, in simple way, you can say a survival of the fittest. So here, uh, I'm here for the cause of adaptation. I strongly believe in this statement and even every life in this planet Earth that has a potential to survive, uh, that has a potential to adapt can only survive. Others will uh, perish. So with this, I thank uh, the opportunity given and I thank you so much for all of you for listening to me and I will be happy to discuss with you. Ratula, over yes. to you. Thank you, Salim, uh, for that, for keeping to time and uh, you know keeping the presentation so succinct. And I think you brought home uh, some of the key points. Also, I think you took us very sort of quickly through two of these instruments uh, in two very different contexts um, and how they've been used in order to sort of adapt cities uh, to this kind of change uh, and the risks perceived by sea level rise. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you um, and open it up for questions and comments uh, from our audience. Those who wish to uh, raise a question, you can use either the chat box or you can also raise your hand uh, in the icons. And uh... okay. Yes. Do we have anyone? Sorry, I'm not able to see all the names in one go. So while we wait for uh, some questions to emerge, uh, possibly, Sadeen, uh, what was interesting is, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, the community local knowledge that uh, sort of was used in the case of uh, in in the Chennai example that you showed us and and how community sort of played an interesting role uh, an important role and also kind of uh, being part of that discussion um, is this something that's usual practice is this part of the basic or is this something that went over and beyond the mandate uh, You know, uh, BASIC is built mainly on the context of community adaptation. So we use the three pillar information uh, that is purely dependent on the uh, scientific and academia that gives the information related to sea level rise. Whereas the other two pillar like um, communication and education is purely focused for the purpose of uh, building capacity of local communities. So the, the three pillars academia plus the community involvement in decision making. Okay. So we, we want to replicate BASIC uh, or adopt BASIC in different other programs of uh, coastal related activities uh, mm -hmm. in coast of Tamil Nadu. Okay. Uh, it is not only for cities, but anywhere, uh, even the rural area, provided if it is related to coast and sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you sort of bring communities together? Because, you know, there are many different communities with different kinds of vulnerabilities. Here, it seemed as if it was the local fishermen um, living on the coast who were sort of uh, going to be the most affected, but it could be others as well. So how do you identify, bring them on board uh, for this kind of exercise? Yeah. So first thing we did is stakeholder analysis. We identified list of stakeholders who can play a role, both in terms of impact as well as in terms of uh, decision making. So we identified list of stakeholder and then we prioritized who ranks first, who are the 
uh, most important. We name them as a key stakeholders, uh, followed by primary, secondary, and tertiary stakeholders. So key stakeholders are our main concern. In this case, uh, fishing communities. In particular, uh, we give emphasis to artisanal fishers because that area uh, is within the estuarine region. So we have two different fishers. One go to the sea and do the fishing. Another is uh, doing fishing in the backwaters or the estuarine water. So in many of the government related fisheries activities or fisheries management, only the voice of fishing community from the sea has been heard, not this community or the one who does fishing in the uh, estuarine region. Uh, they are called artisanal fishers. So in the one of our strength of our uh, work is we involved artisanal fishers uh, in decision making process. Great. So that is like something unique. Mm -hmm. Their voices are here. So I'm aware that there are different regulatory devices already in place. Uh, supposing you know you have the the development plans which are uh, essentially spatial land use maps, uh, right? Which say where and how much can be developed on on in cities, right? Uh, yeah. You know the kind of densities one can do, or the kind of infrastructure one can build, and the kind of land use one one can sort of convert that land to. Um, then you have, uh, you know, post, of course, the, the environmental sort of policies that have come in, you have the coastal zonal maps, supposedly, uh, and the regulation, uh, coastal regulation zones that have come up, although, you know, they're being uh, diluted <laughs> by many different uh, uh, stakeholders. But the fact is that these, these are different regulatory devices that already exist. So I wanted to know when you come up with something like this, like a decision making tool, where does it intersect or where does it draw from or where does it fit into these um, other larger devices uh, that are already there? Um, uh, how and who sort of brings these together? Is, is there like an institution or a body uh, that is looking at all of this data that's coming through and trying to sort of integrate all of this knowledge together? Uh, in Put it in one single word, we use the word mainstreaming. So that is also one of our uh, focus area that uh, not only contributing or communicating science to policy, but also make sure that policy has been uh, mainstream in the right way. As you said, there are so many developmental activities, particularly in our concern, it's a very controversial area. You have big industries there. We have thermal power plant, now there is a private port is planning to come there. And we have mangroves, we have fish, I mean, uh, small aquaculture ponds, and also the uh, livelihood of fishers, fishing communities are there. Now, this is a complex system. Whereas our role is not to criticize any of the policies which is already existing. Whereas we find an intervention where uh, here in this case, climate change and sea level rise, because that is a new domain. So that we want to plug in this information into their developmental plan. For example, CRZ, earlier CRZ notification is only on the 500 meters. Now, if you see, they have a high tide uh, line. This is called hazard line. Hazard line is a line drawn uh, parallel to the coastal area that also encompasses CRZ zone plus the new component, which is sea level rise. So earlier CRZ zone in the beginning, they not talked much about CR, I mean sea level rise. It is just the CRZ zone, 500 meter from the uh, mean sea level. Now the hazard line talks about uh, includes the sea level, which means what? If that is a 0.5 meter, another thousand hectares of land may get inundated. So that thousand hectare is now added. So our role is to inform that that extra thousand hectares. Uh, in case of land use planning. Whereas in adaptation planning, uh, this we trade in Pichavaram mangroves, uh, which is not a city area, but we're trying to adopt that model to Mennur also because we have some patches of mangroves there. Now, what we suggested there, mangrove has two options. One, we need to protect mangroves as part of the developmental activity as forest management or coastal management. Now, sea level rise is coming into the picture. So there also we are suggesting we need to restore mangroves in the landward migration. 
So the net point is we need to conserve mangroves. Now, the point is there was one question raised. If there are no sea level rise as expected, then what will happen to the amount of adaptation fund that you get from the union government or any funding mechanism like 50 crore money, you invest in a particular location of mangroves and regenerate the mangroves. But end of the day, there is no sea level rise as you expect. Then according to that principle that you wasted the money, that's what we changed the philosophy. It is not just adapting to sea level rise, but you're mainstreaming. Let us assume there is no sea level rise as expected. And despite you invested 50 crore and regenerated mangrove, still it benefits the ecosystem there, the biodiversity there, the fishing communities there. So at that point of intervention is what we are justifying. So earlier, the beginning of climate change debate, at least in Indian context, it was standalone. You talk only about adaptation, adaptation fund, invest money. And now we started rethinking our ideas. What if there is not expected sea level rise? But still, it will answer the other side of developmental perspective. The mangroves are restored. That answers to the forest department. The fisheries livelihood are ensured. That answer to the rural development department. So it is a kind of uh, intervention. And that is a new um, school of thought that we climate researchers who concern about the policy kind of activities are involved. So that is our way of approach. Hope I have answered your question, Ratola. Yes, yes. Um, we have two questions in the chat box from students. Sonia is asking, mm -hmm. you discussed two case studies based on two different places. And according to your experience, how responsive are different countries uh, or different cities when it comes to implementing such instruments of climate change uh, challenges, particularly, you know, like you said, adaptation uh, is what you're sort of pushing for. Um, so that, and I think, you know, it would be interesting because of course the government's arrangements are different uh, in cities like New York, where the mayor has, you know, a lot of more power than, uh, you know, the state government or the central government. Although some of their, probably their uh, funds do come from FEMA, which is much more central authority, like the federal authority sends uh, funds for disaster mitigation, et cetera. But in adaptation, um, so how, how does it actually, uh, how did you see the two different uh, cities um, respond uh, to these adaptation measures? Uh, to be very honest, uh, of course, the developed nations are very proactive. For example, even in my research, when I landed up there, I was going with this idea that I need to do a sea level rise projections modeling. But everything was done there already, which means like the people are already fast and proactive. And so I don't need to do anything because all the data and information already there. I Then only we changed their idea. Why don't we synthesize all these information because that is what lacking there. And then we came up with the idea called Corridor. Whereas in India, in Chennai, even 2020, still we are trying to refine the sea level rise projection, particularly the impact assessment, the quality of the data, the satellite images that we do for uh, land use, land cover, and its impact, sea level rise impact. Earlier we used, uh, I myself used SRTM 30 meter, shuttle radar topography, 30 meter. Then we slowly moved to Aster data, then we move to DGPS data. Now we are looking for LIDAR or LIDAR data, which is less than one meter accuracy. So still we are in the process even to get a more accurate uh, mapping of area of inundation. So we are definitely uh, at least 10 years behind them. So I would say it is not good to compare New York and Chennai because each one stands in a different places, both in the way they work. But if you take India as such, we have shown enormous progress compared to our past and present. Rather to compare ourselves with uh, New York, it's we have marched way ahead because COP 15, 2009 at Copenhagen, that's the first time the whole world looked for India, what they're going to tell. Before that, India's voice was not much heard. Nobody bothered in COP, uh, UNFCC COP. But COP 15 onwards, now India is a big player. So the, the people are waiting to hear from India what stand they're going to take. 
So this is at the policy level, whereas the local level also, we have developed with so many mechanisms. 2008, when the Prime Minister Council on National Action Plan on Climate Change was established, and we have a report that is on 2008. Now, 2012, all the state governments have come up with the state action plan on climate change. Now, 2016, we have second revision or version of, it's called 2.0 of the state action plan. Now, why it is important at the local level? Because state action plans make a platform to channelize the money from Global Climate Fund or Adaptation Fund, which was the international funding mechanism, or even the national funding. We have nationally, uh, I told you, or I showed my one of the slides, DSD Splice Program. So that is a positive sign. Earlier, we had no Splice Program. Now, the last five to six years, the government, in the context of education and research, they are investing money in climate change. So SPLICE is a one such an example. And we have something called National Adaptation Fund. As a climate change program officer, I work for government of Tamil Nadu. Uh, so I, along with our team, uh, we drafted a document to get the National Adaptation Fund to rehabilitate coral reef in uh, Gulf of Manna region in Tutukuri in Kerala, in Tamil Nadu. So I was so happy. There are a number of projects on Gulf of Manna biosphere under the Ministry of Environment, Coral Reef Protection. But this is the first project in the name of adaptation, and that is our success. And that is the answer to your question. Are we proactive? Yes, these days we are warming up. There are so many activities, both policy, legislation, money, education, we are coming up. What we can do is we can learn from New York or London or anything, rather to compare themselves, better we can learn the techniques, the methods, or whatever they adopt, uh, so that we can uh, replicate the same thing if it is suits for us. If you want to compare, it's better to compare ourselves before and now. And in that case, we have shown a very good progress the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change has done enormous work and all state governments are now coming up with a new, new idea. I, I told you, uh, in fact, I was telling that to my students, what next after masters? Don't worry, there is a position called program officer in climate change. Earlier, there was no such program. Uh, there's no such position because they have this doubt. We study climate change, what is uh, the scope? We have in government chief engineer, executive engineers, but this is the first time at least in Tamil Nadu case, they have a position called program officer. So answer to your question, uh, young lady, that uh, we have shown a good progress and it's better to compare ourselves in the past and now, and we are growing. And it's good to learn from the uh, developed nations or wherever the good things are happening to mimic adaptation. Um, are there any more questions, comments from our audience? Yes, Amita. Go ahead. So, so my question was actually, uh, Salim, about the lack of data. And you talked about the lack of uh, localized data even now, in not just Chennai, but in many of our, uh, I would say, geographic, geographies of the country. So what are the things which are being done to address that um, at a country level, uh, besides the efforts that you said your team was taking up, and what all needs to go into that data besides the predictions of uh, localized sea level rise or localized climate change impact. So what goes into assessing that localized uh, climate change impact? Um, first, lack of data, it is, Definitely there, um, because I would say it is for two reasons. One, still we need to do a lot of work, a lot of data need to be generated. Another, there is lack of access to data. And I think that is the biggest challenge here. Uh, because we depend data, for example, in climate data, the Indian Meteorological Department is doing wonderful work and they have a good quality data. 
but to access the data requires it is very costly so one cannot easily get the data so there may be some kind of incentives that data can be given cheaper cost or it could given free of cost depends on the uh, project or the program that we can that we are doing so the data access is important and two for example indian institute of tropical meteorology they are doing a wonderful research on climate and isro they have doing wonderful research on climate again if you want to we have portal to uh, uh, look for a data and there are mechanisms but we want to make it a little more transparent so transparent uh, is another uh, way so that for example lidar data so first when i search for a lidar data or lidar data i was not even able to know whether it is available for our indian region or not so to know that information it took lot of patience and finally we found out it is hidden somewhere or it is not sh uh, showcased uh, clearly so it was there unless you find out my point is we should make it transparent so one uh, it could we can give some kind of an incentives so that the data can be available freely to access and two the data should come out at least to tell these data as we are having um, uh, but there's one challenge with the coastal data because it comes under defense department so one cannot get data just like that because we need to get a clearance from the defense uh, ministry then only we can get so to, so so can i add on to this question salim yeah yeah go ahead so still i think ki ek if one is talking about citizen involvement i think transparent and accessible data besides being accessible to scientists it needs to be also accessible to citizens right that's yeah. one the second is ki what should be therefore the data management framework that we have why is our data so clear i would say so hidden why is it so departmentalized what are the barriers there uh, if you can tell us a little bit because it is so <laughs> yeah because my experience basically is that we uh, in india in some ways it is the society which has been uh, usually in most cases i would say uh, more proactive than per se government especially in environmental matters right so from that point of view if one can make data more accessible to citizens and for that have a more unified data system now um, again the in concern to data uh, i think you, you asked one question like why the data is hidden why it is not coming up maybe because of leadership i would say because like my experience in tamil nadu Uh, during my period as a climate change program officer we developed a portal which is called climate change knowledge system so in that system every districts of tamil nadu uh, will get their climate data uh, will like a, it is a kind of a exercise we did it uh, climate of the present and the future in a one page pdf both in english and tamil now that has been successful because mainly because of the leader who we work with because they are proactive they are fighting with dst to channelize the fund under the national mission on strategic knowledge management then we devised this mechanism called knowledge based climate change knowledge based system and we partnered with anna university and government of tamil nadu so what end of the day it is because of that leadership that group of team they made the way whereas other states did not did it only handful of states now tamil nadu and couple of other states of like role model for the other rest of the states to follow this particular model of accessing fund in particular to make this data available for the public so leadership plays a major role if my that particular leadership team did not thought about it fight for that fund they should have not come so leadership is an important role where we can bring out the hidden data and and it in other words you can say mindset of people that particularly the uh, the senior people they should come up and and give this data have this foresight and to the citizen information of course the data can be given with limitations 
uh, there are different sectors of people out there, general public, research community, uh, corporate, industries. So each one requires different, different sort of data sets. Now we are in the world of cloud data, big data management, and moving even to fog data. So the science of data is going. We are using artificial intelligence to manage data. And I, I personally handle difficulty to store the climate data, which requires a supercomputer where my university is not able to provide supercomputer to store the data. So we are talking in that language. But at the other end, my student is not able to, or the farmer is not able to get the data what he wants. Now, I don't understand the irony why there is contradictory. One side, climate data, big data, artificial intelligence, and other side, scarcity of data, fighting for data. Now, this thing should be break. We need to break all these things and find a, a data management mechanism. Now, what sort of data is required by whom and how it needs to be delivered? In fact, the climate services talks about that. If you see GFCS guidelines, the very first point they talking is delivering of climate information. They simply finish it there. In that, they have different components how to deliver. So this particular data management system should be strengthened. Then I think the data can be Utilize. We no need to generate new data. We have enough data already. Only thing is access and make use of the data is there something lacking. So leadership and the data management uh, mechanism should be strengthened. These two are my answers. I hope I answered you, uh, Amita. Yeah, thank you. Uh, like I still don't understand key, how the Ministry of Defense is involved there. So, in terms of what are the barriers, I have not clearly understood yet. Really. So, leadership, I can understand because that, that seems to be, you're saying that there is basically an inertia to work out systems. But besides that, are there any others is something which I'm thinking about, but we can discuss it later as well. There may be other questions. So, thanks just, so much. Sally. Yeah, just one point uh, with reference to defense. So, defense play a role in, to my knowledge, on the coastal system. Because of the country's security reason, uh, they have their own uh, agendas. We cannot violate that. Even if you want to access the data, satellite image from ISRO for the coastal region, uh, you need, there is a letter that you need to get clearance from uh, defense. I think those are genuine cases because when you look for the security of a country, of course, that is the high priority. So we need to follow that. But that is not the case for even the landlocked area. There also, if you want, that, uh, that's my um, bothering. Genuine reasons, if there is some kind of a checklist to cross through it, yeah, understood. But that should not be the cases even to just to get the rain data from rain guard station. Um, if you have, I think we're nearing sort of our six o'clock mark. Uh, yeah. So one of the questions that are here, I can see in the chat box is, how do we prioritize, we are Gargas asking, uh, how do we prioritize any one of the retreat, protect and adjust methods in SLR adaptation, as in what influences the choice? Good, this is really a place-based strategies. So whatever strategies we are coming up, that is very subjective. For example, even in the East Coast of Tamil Nadu, uh, we have Chennai city, uh, there is one good example, particularly during tsunami. There's something called Kadalur, there's one of the coastal district. And down to that, there is a something called Nagapattinam, which is another coastal district. So when tsunami struck the coast of this region, Kadalur was least affected comparatively, whereas Nagapattinam was heavily affected. Now, later scientists kind of understood it is maybe because of mangroves that located in Kadalu region, that is called Pichavaram mangroves. The uh, casualties were very less when compared to Nagapattinam area. Now, when you plan for adaptive strategies, in this case, landward migration of mangroves. So you build the or restore the mangroves in a larger area. So that is not possible at the Nagapattinam coast because that place is not favorable to develop mangroves. Mangroves grows only in the region of where salt water mixed with the fresh water. 
that kind of an environment you can find in Kadalu region. So that kind of adaptive strategies to restore mangroves through a mechanism called landward migration is possible. Whereas it is not possible in Nagapatnam, maybe we need to look for another adaptive strategy, for example, seawall. So what I'm trying to tell here is, uh, they are very case-based or subject-specific based on the location of a particular coastal area. And two, the choice of adaptation depends on the, again, the nature. Here, mangroves are present, so we are uh, making the landward migration, whereas the other adaptation, which is nothing but a Is that fine? Did you get some kind of insight? Uh, Salim, we just lost you in that last two sentences. It got wobbled. Can you just repeat that? Uh, yeah. So answer one is place-based. So based on the place, you take the adaptation. Answer two is choice-based. Now the choice depends on what is possible there. Uh, whereas Kadalur, mangroves are possible. Whereas in uh, Nagapattinam, mangroves are not possible, so you need to go for the next choice, seawall. That condition you can also see in Chennai, I'm sure even in Mumbai also. In Chennai, there is a river called Kuvam River and Adair River. There you find patches of mangroves. So it is possible to regenerate or grow mangrove in that area. Whereas Marina Beach, which is the second largest beach in Asia, we cannot grow mangroves. Both are in the Chennai coast. So, as I said, it is place based or location specific, and two, the choice based choice based on what sort of ecosystem infrastructure are available. Based on that, you can design your strategy. Okay, uh, we have Anurupa who wants to ask a question. Yes, Anurupa, you can unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, hello, sir. Uh, I have one question. Uh, when we talk about this um, uh, coastal adaptation, uh, we are adapting for the sea level rise. But also these days we are uh, seeing uh, many incidents of tropical cyclones which are happening in the coastal area that also affects that. So mm -hmm. adapting to one, does it overlap with adaptation to the cyclonic impacts as well? Or is there yeah. any, any different way? Uh, I think during my presentation, I've uh, given the definition of IPCC to sea level rise. So earlier in AR1, assessment report one, sea level rise means just uh, increase in rise in water from the mean sea level. Whereas AR5, you see the definition for adaptation. It is not only the increase in or permanent rise in sea level from the mean sea level, but also the height of the storm surges or the cyclones. So first thing is, let us understand what is sea level. And two, the adaptation, when we plan, that's what I was talking to Rathula, mainstreaming. So whenever we plan to achieve a aim, we always to have short-term targets and long-term goals. Now short-term, uh, again, the case of mangroves, for example, when you plant mangroves for a short-term, it may, help in protecting you from cyclones, maybe, or it helps in a livelihood of people. In a long term, it helps in protection from permanent rise in sea level. Now, even in the heart structure, the sea wall, it answers to both the question, provided if your mechanism of implementing that structure is efficient. If you just want to build a sea level to cyclones like Varda or Neelam or Thane, whatever, then your duration or the stability of the structure or durability of that structure is just for five years or 10 years. But if you bring the element of sea level rise, then you add some more element in the concrete structure. That makes your that physical structure much more stronger that can withstand for another 50 years. In example, in Chennai, North Chennai, we have structure called Groens. In the North Chennai, we have Chennai port. On top of the port, it's full of coastal erosion. And down to the port, that's where the Marina Beach is there. It's more of 
soil accretion. Now, if you walk through that or drive through that area, you find a growing structure. Now, growing is an engineering marvel that is placed on the shore area that reduces the speed of the wave. Now, these growings are just to answer the uh, cyclones or the soil erosion. Now, what we are telling, now you need to strengthen the growing structure in such a way that can withstand for a long time. Because the city government is spending at least 50 crore every year just to maintain that growing structure. If we do not maintain, the entire North Chennai may go underwater, particularly during storm surges. Now, that's a good idea. But our suggestion is, what is your answer for the next 100 years? How long this groin is going to exist? What is next after groins? Now, we are giving, uh, we are with IIT Madras, uh, giving such kind of uh, suggestions of strengthening the concrete materials so that it can have the durability for the next uh, 20 more years extra. So that thought has come after the idea of uh, debate of sea level rise and adaptation came into picture. Or else it is just growing and maintaining the growings. And there is no point or no discussion to add the extra concrete, the particular material that can withstand for much more long year. Did I answer you, Anurupa? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So I remember I, in a particular conference during Jakarta, I visited a fishing village, which was practically going underwater. So they had a wall that was there. Um, and there, it was a demand of this community to actually, uh, you know, uh, not be displaced because the government was only just going to displace them, move them yeah. somewhere else. But they said, you know, our lives and our uh, identity is tied also with the sea because that's what we do. And so we don't want to be moved. So what they had personally done to adapt themselves was actually build housing, which was on stilts. Um, and, you know, so they moved uh, their houses upwards. So it was interesting to sort of see these kind of local level tweaking that was going on. Uh, but the larger sort of decision in Indonesia at that moment was a favorable decision before the pandemic struck was actually to move the capital uh, inwards like from Jakarta to uh, to another place, which was basically a, another sort of forest area, which was another mm -hmm. eco-sensitive forest area. So, and it seemed as if there was a lot of interest by real estate developers, et cetera, to sort of have that new capital uh, developed. So I'm just wondering in terms of um, understanding this as, as this complex sort of contestedness about season land, uh, you know, and even in Bombay, we sort of see how the coastal road has led to reclamation of land, uh, you know, and there are real fears and worries about what are we doing? Like, how, how is it that instead of understanding um, these kind of ebbs and flows of the sea and the particular kind of risks and threats uh, of climate change that is all too real, how do we still sort of go about building infrastructure that seems to you know, uh, not answer to, uh, you know, any kind of environmental impact assessment or social impact assessment kinds of bypasses all kinds of laws and regulations, but still comes about, right? So just wanted to hear from you when you talk about these decision-making tools, uh, how does it address the real politics on the ground, the developers' interests, the politicians' interests, um, the interests of uh, you know the local people uh, is there a is there a way to sort of really have those discussions um, more broad based discussions and where can we do it and how can we do it? Yeah, that's a very good question and it's a very complex to answer as well because that is the real time challenge on ground. Uh, you talk so much about simplim models adaptation, IPCC, everything, but on ground, when you want to implement, uh, it's it's not easy to do it. Uh, in Netherlands, Amsterdam, there's something called floating villages. See, that is one of the um, uh, marvelous to address the sea level rise at the community level, how the community itself 
uh, adapting to sea level rise. So it is a community cooperation with the engineering and scientific ideas. The, it's called floating village. So the village floats according to the rise in seawater. Now it sounds good for Netherlands, but will it sound good possible for India? That's the question. What we have observed uh, as a citizen, not as a scientist, the law that makes a lot of difference because that is the only weapon uh, that can bring everything online, particularly CRZ. Now, without CRZ, we have damaged NF to the coast. Now, even with the CRZ, we still damage it. There are rare examples, like there is one apartment that has been demolished in Kerala. Yeah. Uh, by the Supreme Court verdict. Uh, I, I forgot the name of that apartment. That is a success. Now, what is the underlying point there is the law. The judicial system was very strict. So I think that is the very, very powerful weapon that we need to have a strict policy. Uh, I was uh, taking part in one of the lectures that is under a topic adaptation law. Now only we are talking about adaptation and there they're talking about adaptation law in the Earth Institute. And I, it's very surprising for me. Uh, the take home message of that con uh, conference is judicial system plays uh, make a lot of differences. Second, the political will. Now the political will that is highly depend on the uh, both the administrators as well as the, the ruling parties. Uh, nowadays, we are seeing a good sign of these political party in their manifesto talking about green. Earlier, there was not like there's only TV, refrigerator, at least in Tamil Nadu. But nowadays, they're talking about green. We'll plant 100 trees. We plant, you know, desalination of water. These manifestos, agendas were not there before. Now it is coming up. With that spirit, the political will should take this uh, sea level rise and climate change complex uh, information seriously uh, and importantly the administrator merge that information in the developmental plan and in Chennai we have the sea level uh, we have this uh, ECR recreational corridor uh, and despite we have CRZ zone we have a national green tribunal sits in Chennai despite of that still it is growing up now where is the problem it is the judicial, which is not strict, or the uh, administration, which is not. You know, I think uh, we have enough knowledge in science planning. Uh, we can even mimic the Netherlands model, or we can mimic anything else, like Palm Jumeirah creating an artificial island. India concerned, the scientific knowledge is adequate, or uh, we are even potential to grab from elsewhere. But the problem is, according to me, uh, to answer your question, uh, how to make these things successful. It is the law and judicial system. It is the administrative structure. Of course, the citizen's mindset. Now we are all tuned to similar mindset. Now we need to change ourselves as well. Then only we can bring a difference to make this adaptation strategy successful. Uh, we are doing it in ecosystem-based adaptation, mangroves and corals. Luckily, they do not have, they are not like humans, right? <laughs> they'd have changed their mind. So those things are a little successful. Involving community and people and making this successful, where we have a long way to go. Okay. Um, is there any more questions or uh, comments from the audience? I don't see any more hands. So, uh, Salim, thank you so much for joining us and uh, you know, giving this uh, talk, it's, it's great to sort of hear a colleague's work uh, in progress and to sort of, you know, uh, have this kind of conversation because we miss our, uh, you know, usual sort of uh, discussions on the corridors, on in our corridors in this, uh, where, you know, a lot of this knowledge exchange happens between faculty, between faculty and students and across students of different programs. So it's just great that you know you you're here and you've sort of presented this to us, and um, you know hopefully you know we can collaborate further as we sure. sort of move along, right? So thank yeah, you certain. everyone.
uh, for joining us. Uh, we'll close the talk now. Uh, yes. Thank you, Ratula, and thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yes.